Welcome to Warrior Selling, the world's most influential sales training program, presented by FPG CEO Jason Forrest with FPG President Mary Marshall. You're about to learn the philosophy and core beliefs that create profit-driving sales warriors. Jason and Mary are two of the world's few certified master practitioners in neuro-linguistic programming, a science-based approach to driving behaviors that get results. Named one of the top 30 sales gurus in the world, Jason has been named the world's best sales trainer, and he's written five award-winning training programs. His sales process modeled on these warrior selling beliefs also won an award as the most innovative and effective in the world. It's time for your team to believe what a sales warrior believes, so they can earn what a sales warrior earns. Hey, this is Jason Forrest, CEO of FPG. Thank you for spending some time with me on what I believe are the beliefs that cause top salespeople to stay at the top. Here's how this recording works. First, I'm going to give you a summary of the philosophy of our Warrior Selling Sales Training Program. Next, we're going to go through each of the 15 beliefs of a sales warrior. After each belief, you'll hear a deeper dive into the belief with me and FPG President Mary Marshall, who's also an amazing thought leader and keynote speaker. This is going to give you, the listener, a clear picture of the concepts and beliefs that really create a true sales warrior. Enjoy. The question I'm asked the most is, what is a sales warrior? The best way for me to answer this is to share with you the philosophy and the 15 beliefs that form the root of our award-winning warrior selling training program. I think philosophies are everything in life. Think about a philosophy when it comes to being a parent. I've adopted a really simple philosophy as a parent that I have two main roles that I share with my kids to keep you safe and to set you up for success. That's my simple philosophy. Every time my two kids push back or they argue with me, I go right back to that concept and I ask, hey, what's my job as a parent? And they say, well, it's to keep me safe and to make me successful. And I'll say, great. So is what I'm asking you to do right now in alignment with keeping you safe and making you successful? And then we're immediately back in rapport. Instead of spending all this time arguing and going back and forth, now we're back on the same page. That's my parenting philosophy. Look, everyone has a philosophy. The question is, is it serving you? Is it helping you to achieve the goals you want to achieve in life? Sometimes it's not. See, I wasn't a successful parent until I adopted that philosophy. I had a different philosophy that caused me to make less effective choices with my kids on a daily basis. Now, I have a philosophy that's actively serving me and helping my kids grow. Uh, think about Pete Carroll, the coach of the Seattle Seahawks. One of the things he does is he has each of his players create their own personal philosophy about the kind of player they're going to be at their position. But it's not uh, whatever philosophy they had before they joined the team. Their Seahawks philosophy is entirely about what value they're going to bring to the team and how they're going to show up for their teammates on a daily basis. When they're out on the field, they all have a better grasp of who their teammates are because they all have philosophies aligned with the vision of the team. You see, one of the things Pete Carroll realized is that each of these players had their own philosophies, but it might not have been the, the one that served them best for themselves and their team and their future. So they created a new philosophy as a team and they won the Super Bowl. Larry Gelwix is the winningest high school rugby coach of all time. The movie Forever Strong was based off his story. And there was this one scene in the movie where a player comes to the coach and complains, Coach, uh, why, do we, why do we have so many rules on this rugby team? The coach responded, we only have one rule on this team. Don't ever do anything that dishonors yourself, your family, and your team. See, that was his philosophy, and he instilled that into his players, and they created the winningest rugby team of all time with new kids every single year. See, that's why a philosophy is really everything in life. So right now, I'm going to share with you the philosophy of warrior selling, and the philosophy of warrior selling is all 
human beings, move away from pain and toward life improvement. And a sales warrior's mission is to liberate them from any indecision. See, what an important word, all, all. I didn't say some or few or many or most. I'm drawing a line in the sand by saying all, all human beings are moving away from pain and toward life improvement. Think about the things you do on a daily basis. Why do you do them? To get away from pain and move towards life improvement. So whatever you buy and whatever decisions you make, you're trying to move toward something better. Maybe you're selling to consumers and that life improvement means more happiness or fulfillment in their personal life. Or maybe you're selling to other businesses and that life improvement means more speed and profitability for their company. At the end of the day, the effect is the same. Their lives are improved. The second part of our philosophy is that a sales warrior is on a mission to liberate their customers from indecision. A mission, not a goal or a desire or a want or an intention, a mission. See, I believe there's nothing more crippling to sales than ambiguity. I also believe the number one driving force of the human race is freedom. It's to be liberated from whatever is holding you back from life improvement. Why is it that you leave work and and you get on your GPS and figure out the fastest route on your commute home? Because you want freedom. You want freedom from the traffic jam and your tough work day. And why is it that after a hard day of work, you're looking forward to your kids' eight o'clock bedtime and a nice glass of wine? Because, yep, you want freedom. This is our philosophy. A lot of training companies will tell you our philosophy of selling is to build long-term relationships. And if you take them to enough events and dinners, eventually, yeah, they'll buy from us. That's not the warrior selling philosophy. See, I believe our philosophy is truly what every single customer desires on a root level. They want to know how fast can I get away from pain? How fast can I move toward life improvement? And if there's some sales warrior who's going to liberate me from any of this ambiguity and indecision I'm feeling, I will gladly give them my money. That's what customers want. I sold my first diamond at eight years old in my dad's jewelry store. And in my entire life of selling, I've never once heard a customer say, hey, you know what? I'm going to put off that life improvement until next year. You know what? I'm not happy right now, but I'm just, I'm just going to wait. I'm going to wait until next year to improve my life. Look, once someone really figures out how it's going to improve their life, no one puts that off. No one will ever procrastinate on that decision because it's too important to them. And that's the true philosophy of a sales warrior. So Jason, your warrior selling philosophy is all human beings move away from pain and toward life improvement. And a sales warrior's mission is to liberate them from any indecision. And what I know about most people's philosophy is it's either something where We've seen that somewhere else in our lives, and we're modeling it here within our, within our own lives and our own company, or we're rejecting a different philosophy to create our own. So which one is it for you? Um, it's a great question. I would say it's a little bit of both, right? So both you and I are master practitioners in NLP, neuro, neuro Linguistic Programming. And um, you know, for a long time, what people thought was that that people only buy because they're moving away from pain. That That is a, another training's training company's philosophy. Uh, but what we've realized is that, is that people are more complex than that. People are, are buying and doing anything in life to move away from pain, but also to move towards life improvement. Now, some people are uh, more dominant than others. So for example, uh, my number one way that I buy things is, f- is to move towards life improvement. So if I was to go shopping for a new car today, I would be very, very excited about, I'm going to buy a new car because it's new, it's shiny, it's, it's, um, it's got all these new cool things that I want, but you're different though. I am different. Yes. So you, 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 why would you buy a car today? Uh, to, to get out of an old car that I didn't want. I'm definitely a move away person except for with shoes and handbags, but everything else is a definitely a move away objective. 
So for you, you're more of a move away person. For me, I'm more of a move towards person, but we both have a little bit of both in us uh, depending upon what we're actually purchasing. So for example, from a, as a business owner, as a CEO of the company, um, I'm definitely move, moving towards life improvement, to, towards improving my business from a, a speed and profitability perspective. But I also, there's also times where I just want to stop doing something. Like I want to get away from the pain of the CRM we're currently using because it's causing my salespeople a lot of stress. Um, and so I want to get away from that as fast as possible because I don't like dealing with it anymore. And the second part of the, of the philosophy is that a sales warrior is on a mission to liberate customers from any indecision. And this is important to me because, you know, for the longest time, we've been going through this kind of soft selling uh, revolution. You know, it was actually, I believe, in the 80s when a lot of books came out and they talked about the idea of consultative selling and, this, and they talked about relationship selling. And, and again, I understand what their positive intention was because behind every behavior is a positive intention. And their intention was there were these movies that came out, the Glenn Glary, Glenn Ross, and, and, um, and Wall Street, and movies that kind of gave this persona of a salesperson of being this kind of con artist. And so what we do in society and, and is that we, we kind of take things to the extreme, right? So that was one extreme of like the, the very worst of a salesperson. And so all these authors came out and said, okay, let's be the complete opposite of that. And let's go this very kind of soft, kind of faux friendship. It's all about relationships. And if you spend all this time with them, eventually they're going to buy from you. And, and so what, what I'm really trying to do at FPG is really bring back the pride, purpose, and respect to professional selling. That I actually think that based on science and based on research, that the top sales professionals out there, their number one goal is actually to achieve resolution. It's to, they're on a mission to get customers to remove any indecision they have that's preventing them from that life improvement. And that's what we're really focused on. And, and it makes sense. I mean, if you really think about, um, I mean, wouldn't you want to spend time with a salesperson that they, they truly put your best interest in mind and their best, your best interest was how do you get away from pain and how do you move towards life improvement and how do you do it today? Not tomorrow, next, not next week, not next quarter, but today. Yeah. Well, what I love about that, as you said, it's the sales warrior's mission to achieve resolution. And that's because it's in alignment with the buyer's ultimate mission, which is to achieve resolution. When I need something, when I need a product, a service, I'm shopping for the company or whether I'm shopping for myself and it's something that I need, I just, I want to get it done fast. And so uh, what I love about that is I can think of so many times where I am shopping for something and I'm given all the options and they're like, whatever, whatever you feel is right for you, whatever. You, no, 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 no. Like I told you everything about me. What's the right decision? Give me the right decision so I can, I can finish this and move on and get to the next thing. Exactly. And I'm, and I'm exactly the same way uh, when it comes to uh, sales professionals calling on me at, at FPG, trying to sell me something. I mean, I've got a strong goal out there. We have a strong goal as a company that, uh, you know, we are on the track to become the largest and most successful sales training company out there in the world. And, and uh, we're, we've won year after year, the fastest growing sales training company. And so that's our plan. That's our goal that we're on. So any salesperson that can, that can give me a solution to get that goal accomplished faster, of course I want to hear from them. I'm not going to put that off until next year because I don't have time for it. Uh, time is the thing that's going against me right now. I, I need to do whatever I can to make those decisions today. And if a salesperson can do that, I will gladly buy from them. Jason, the longest segment in this audiobook is about you just telling your philosophy on philosophies. So why is that? Well, I, I believe that, look, everyone in life, again, has a philosophy the, the problem is most people's philosophy is more subconsciously controlling them versus them, them consciously choosing and declaring, here is my philosophy on blank. Here's my philosophy on relationships, on life, on work, um, on working out, on health, on wellness, whatever that is. And, and you know, the example that I gave in, the, in, in here of talking about my parenting philosophy I mean, you're the one that taught me this. You were the one that taught me this. I, I recognized one day and I had awareness that the, the way that I was kind of parenting my kids, I just didn't have enough boundaries that were really set for them. And, and, and so my subconscious kind of autopilot philosophy was more of like the fun dad and having a great time with them. 
It was you that taught me your philosophy, which is uh, to to keep Elizabeth safe, your daughter Elizabeth, to keep her safe, and to help her become successful. And and to me, I thought that was brilliant. So I borrowed your philosophy, and it's my philosophy on how I raised Mary Jane and Saunders as well. Yeah, you're right, Jason. You know, I was very blind to what my philosophy in parenting was until Elizabeth kept asking me, why? Why, mom? Why is this the answer? Why Why did you say no? And realize that, you know, saying, because I said so, or realizing that, because that's what my mom said in that situation. I don't really know why I'm saying this, that I needed to come up with it. And, and that's where the two things came from. And so once I became conscious there, realized, like every area of my life, I want to be making a conscious choice. I don't want to be running on autopilot and just doing things because it's what I've heard before and what I've done before. It's what I've had my last manager said, so it's now what I'm going to say to my team. That wasn't acceptable anymore. And so looking and really defining a philosophy in each area of my life became really important because of that. Uh, yes. And so for everyone who's listening right now, uh, the, the, one of the most important things they can do is figure out what is your philosophy. I hope that you agree with our philosophy of warrior selling, but just the same, uh, decide what is your philosophy in the other areas of your life and watch how that changes your life forever. Okay. So now that we know the philosophy of warrior selling, let's launch into the 15 beliefs of a sales warrior. These are the core truths every sales warrior lives by, and they form the backbone of every single tactic and mental toughness technique you'll find in our warrior selling program. Here we go. Number one, the definition of selling is to give certainty plus education with rapport. See, when certainty is lost, all is lost. Think about it. When you become uncertain in your job, you quit. When your employer becomes uncertain in you, you get fired. When prospects become uncertain about the market or about what you're selling, they don't buy. When clients become uncertain in your status as an advisor, they cancel. This is why certainty is everything. It's the guiding need that every human being has to have to feel safe and secure in life. When you give your customers certainty, you give them happiness. You give them freedom. You give them life improvement. You need to make your prospects feel safe to buy from you. And the only way you can do that is to give them ultimate certainty in their decision to choose you over everyone else. Certainty is nothing more than being their trusted advisor along the way. This means letting the customer know what's coming next in the process. It means making them feel safe with you. It means giving them so much clarity that they'll follow you anywhere. The next part of the equation is education. Selling means constantly teaching your prospects something new. When you learn something new, no matter what it is, dopamine is released into your brain. Think of dopamine like the reward chemical. Have you ever heard of the term an aha moment? That really satisfying split second when you finally figure something out? That's dopamine at work. You can give your prospect an endless supply of dopamine highs. All you have to do is educate them. And the final piece of the puzzle is rapport. The definition of true rapport is one of the most misunderstood things in sales. So many people tell me, Jason, rapport is just whatever I have in common with my prospect. That's how we get on the same page. Look, here's the problem with that line of thinking. It doesn't actually move sales forward. It pauses them. And sometimes it even ends them. True rapport is understanding what the prospect wants. What is their outcome? What are they trying to achieve? And then it's about being in alignment with that vision so you can help guide them to total, complete life improvement by fulfilling that vision. When you see a soccer sticker on their car and decide to spend five minutes of the sale talking soccer instead of moving the sale forward, that's not rapport. That's a faux friendship. All great sales warriors don't just understand this message. They revere it and take it to heart. Customers can't argue with their own advice. And when you educate them on how your product or service is about to improve their life, that's the most powerful selling message there is. So Jason, here on the idea that the definition of selling is to give certainty plus education with rapport. I think all salespeople that are out there, they're so knowledgeable about their product, about their service, about what they're selling, that they're able to give education. But Sometimes it's the wrong education or sometimes it's not as strong. How can we strengthen and choose what we need to teach a customer in a certain situation? Well, the, you know, to me, what's really, really important, and this happens a lot, is that 
when whenever you first you know meet a customer for the first time, you know, they're they're obviously coming to you because they've got some sort of expressed need. They have some sort of either it's a it's a hidden need or it's an admitted need, but there's obviously some kind of subconscious or conscious reason why they're they're looking to to make a change or buy from you. And that's again in the in the consumer world, it's more of that kind of just looking buyer. But in the business to business world, it's more of the maybe request for proposal or their price shopping. They're just kind of checking things out. And but what I found though is that that you first have to of course ask a bunch of questions to figure out what do they know about what you're offering. You know, where are they in the buying process? But what's even more important is that how often have I heard salespeople say, you know, I just don't think they have enough pain. I don't think they have enough, uh, um, enough reasons why they should make a change. Well, that's where you come in. That's the education piece. So your job is to create more needs through your education. So looking at it from a consumer purchase perspective, when you're, you're out there and you're looking to buy a new car, you know there's something wrong with your current car, you're checking out new, new options, and then all of a sudden, you know, they show you the air-conditioned seats that you didn't realize that you could have. Or now, that you can get cars now with, with massagers in your, in your chairs, which is nuts to me. I didn't even know that was possible until I, until I drove a brand new car. And so that's that education that I'm talking about. And so the biggest thing I want people to get out of this is that Figure out what your people already know, what your what your customer already knows, but then you want to provide even more education that exceeds the cost of change, that exceeds the price uh, that you're charging. That's how you also can give them certainty and, of course, stay in alignment with rapport. Well, I love that and teaching them something even more. And so uh, something that I've heard you say before is making sure that you're teaching people things that aren't already on the website. Right, because we talk all the time. Oh, our buyers today are so educated. They've spent so much time online before they ever talk to a salesperson. You're right. What are those extra things that we can truly become the advisor with instead of just rehashing everything that they can already read easily on our website? So I love that. Now, Jason, the other part of this definition of selling that is a little bit trickier is the idea of rapport. And I think I think it's a little bit trickier because there is not a sales book podcast, trainer, sales manager that is not talking about rapport. However, you're the only person I've ever heard speak about rapport in this way. Can you, can you say it again? Can you give us a little bit more about that? Yeah. So rapport is being on the same page with your customer. So think of it as we need to make sure we understand what is the outcome frame? What is the goal? Again, what is the customer trying to move towards as it relates to life improvement? And what are they trying to move away from? So let's use a business example. So let's say you're talking to a company and you're trying to sell them a new piece of software. And you you want to figure out what is really the outcome frame? What how What's the speed they're trying to improve in their organization? What's the, the gross margin they're trying to improve? What's the profitability they're trying to improve? You're trying to figure those things out so that you can then align how your product and service will help them achieve that goal. So as long as you're always in rapport with them, with what they're really trying to accomplish on a bigger chunk, on a bigger level, uh, then you can add all the certainty and education to that. Another way to look at it is if you come across with lots of certainty and education, meaning that you're very dogmatic, right? You believe so much in what you're saying. You, of course, have all the evidence to back up what you're saying, all the claims and all the research. But you're, you're out of rapport with them means you, you really don't know what their goals are. They're not going to pay attention to you. They're not going to listen to you. So it's really important to have certainty plus education with rapport. Well, that, and that feels so much more in alignment with me with what feels natural as a sales professional. I can remember um, some sales training I went through years ago, and they taught us um, because we would cold walk into offices or meetings. We were off on site all the time in other people's offices. Um, I was a business to business salesperson then, and I would walk in and they said, okay, the most important thing is you look around the office and find something that you can connect to. So whether that's a picture frame and they have a child the same age as you, or whether you see a college flag or a letter from, you need to pick up something so you can connect with them. And I remember trying that over and over. And then feeling so awkward of like, okay, well, now let's talk about the product. And it was, it, it, it started us on a weak foot. It started us off on the wrong page. And then it was a lot harder to, for me to feel strong and powerful going into my sales message after starting on such a weak start. Yeah. And the reason is because it felt ingenuine. It's almost like, 
you know, you were, you were, um, you know, hanging out at a cocktail party and just having this kind of fake faux friendship conversation where two people are look, we know we don't want to talk about this. Why are we talking about this? And it's just this very kind of fake conversation. I mean, I, I've heard trainers say the same thing that you want to, you're right. Look at, look at things on their walls. And, you know, if they've got lots of trophies, that must mean that they're a, you know, kind of significance driven, driven type buyer, uh, you know, and you got to kind of model and match those things. And, and, uh, yes, to me, in my opinion, that only throws you off because the one thing I do know about selling to business to business, and this is important for everyone to hear. And that is the, the CEO's time is everything. And if you go in there and you start talking about, you know, how was their weekend or, Hey, did you catch the last Cowboys game? Well, now they're also thinking that you're not, you're not a hard worker because they don't have weekends. CEOs work seven days a week. And so all that kind of faux friendship type stuff is actually going to hurt you as their business advisor going forward. I love that. So going forward for all of us is certainty plus education with rapport. And of course, the rapport is making sure you know what their mission is and that you're getting them closer to that mission. That's rapport. Perfect. Number two, the rule of selling is to make it easy for people to spend money to improve their lives. People don't spend money if the choices are too complicated. Every customer is constantly in search of life improvement, but only if you can remove all the barriers keeping them from buying. If it's a consumer sale, they've worked extremely hard for their paycheck and to save up to buy from you. If you're selling to another business, they've probably spent hours and hours working internally to budget the money to pay for what you're offering. And so because they've worked so hard to budget that money, you don't want to give them another job or task by making things harder for them. You don't want them to, to make too many decisions. You want it to be a memorable experience. You want them to feel led by you every step of the way. Look, no one does this better than Amazon. And because of this, I'm probably their number one customer. I have several Amazon Echoes in my house. So no matter where I am, I can shout, Alexa, order me. In just a couple of hours, there it is in my house. Now, that is making it easy for people to give you their money. I am so spoiled that if I'm shopping online and I get to the end and they don't take Apple Pay, yep, I'm out. I'm not filling out my address and my credit card information like a caveman. So here's a question for you. How long does it take for someone to buy from you? A sales warrior is constantly shortening that time by eliminating difficult decisions all along the way. The most valuable thing anyone has is their time. You can give your customers their time back by making it as easy as possible to buy from you today. One of the biggest mistakes salespeople make is by either giving their prospect so many options that they get completely overwhelmed or they don't give them any options at all. That completely messes with their brain. They've either told the prospect that they don't care enough to guide them through the process or that they haven't listened to what they really want. When we experience stress, the body immediately treats the moment in the exact same way our ancestors did when an apex predator showed up on the scene. We treat it like a threat. Our bodies lock up while the brain figures out its next move. The same exact thing happens to your prospects when they have a ton of decisions to make. They lock up and they shut down. So here's the thing. Every prospect is dealing with all kinds of anxiety and stress while they're going through the buying process. It's just a natural human reaction to any kind of uncertainty or decision-making. So it's the sales warrior's job to remove every obstacle standing between where the prospect is at that moment and the close. Prospects just aren't equipped to remove every one of those obstacles on their own. They need a guide. And that's where a sales warrior separates themselves from everyone else. So Jason, on this idea of the rule of selling is to make it easy for people to spend money to improve their lives. I know that your sales career started in retail. Others might not know that about you. Um, what did you learn? What have you taken from that retail experience that you're, that you're using today? You know, one of the best things that I learned was I was 16 years old and I worked, I worked at a, a, a clothing store in uh, the Dallas Galleria Mall. And the sales, sales coach said, Jason, there's, there's, there's one simple thing you got to do here, and that's make it easy for customers to spend their money to improve their lives. I learned that from her at 16 years old. And she said, so here's the deal. Every time you put someone in a fitting room, 
I need you to constantly uh, um, uh, bust the clothes out uh, when you put them in the fitting room because every time someone's trying something on and they see a pile of rejects uh, in, 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 their, in, their, in their fitting room, they're going to say, bad shopping day, bad shopping day, eject. So you got to make them feel big and make it feel powerful. Uh, and uh, you cannot let them leave the fitting room uh, with their own clothes back on unless they're going to buy something. Because think about it. Think about the last time you were shopping for something and you were trying something on and it just didn't fit right. And you, you think, you know what? I think I'm going to go, I think I'm going to go find a new size in it. So you put your own clothes back on and then you go try to find a different size. And then what do you tell yourself every single time? I'm done. I'm done. Why? Because it's not worth it. Um, no, it's, it's too much of a hassle. You're right. I, I expect a higher level of service and I want, I want it to be easy and having to put your shoes on and off and keep going back and forth. I'm just not doing it. It's not doing it. And so, so that was our whole philosophy was again, you know, constantly bust out clothes. So they feel like they're winning, making it easy for them to buy, making it easier for them to win. And um, always make sure you're, you're giving them new sizes along the way. I mean, that simple thing, man, I sold so many pieces of clothing to people when I was 16 years old, all because my whole objective was how can I make it easy for them to spend money that improves their life? Well, and, and you're right. I mean, you go into a fitting room and, and every woman makes three different piles that are hanging up. It is the, I haven't tried it on yet, the winner pile and the loser pile. That's right. And that winner and loser rack is your scorecard of the day. And you're right. The more they go on the loser rack, the more, the more unlikely you're to put anything on the, on the winning hook. You're just not going to do it because obviously it's a loser day. You're not going to do it. So just the same thing happens when it comes to business to business selling. So for example, I mean, how often in business to business do does a you're you're pitching your product and let's say it's over the phone and like in our in our world we use Zoom technology so it's a lot of uh, video conferencing and you know what does the prospect say? Hey, just send me over uh, some information so that I can review it and I'll get back to you. Nope, that is not making it easy for them to spend money to improve their life, the life of their business and their future. And so every single time I say the same thing, and that is, um, you know what, what I will do for you is I'm going to create a customized proposal just for you, um, and I, I, but I have to go through it with you. And so let's set up a conversation right now so that I can walk you through the solutions that I can specifically offer you, and we can use that as a conversation tool to make sure I've, I've, I've hit it perfectly just for you. Yeah, Jason, there is nothing more frustrating than a sales professional telling me, all right, Mary, I'm going to send over the contract. Um, I'd love, you know, go ahead and read through it. And, you know, next week on our next call, you know, uh, I'll answer any questions that you have. What? Don't give me homework. I've got stuff to do. I'm not going to read through that contract. You're right. I, and, I, and I realize, what am I going to do? I'm going to sit there with a notepad and I'm going to go through, I'm going to write down all the questions. Then I'm going to try to remember it, talk to you next time. That's not a kind thing to do to somebody. And so being on that side of it, I know um, it's always so important. If I'm going to send a contract to somebody, um, I, do, I want to make it easy. I don't want to give them homework. People do not want more homework. They don't want something else on their to-do list. You're selling to somebody that's busy. You're selling to somebody that has a lot of things to handle. And so be kind and be compassionate about that and take that off their to-do list. It's the, it's the greatest thing we can do for somebody. That's it. Yeah, people do not want to work to spend money. They work really hard to make money. So the last thing we ever want to do as a sales industry is make them work to spend that money. Number three, the purpose of selling is to convince the just looking buyer to buy from you today over all alternatives. The sales warrior's purpose is to convince the customer that you're the best choice for them over the competitors they're also considering. They believe so strongly in improving the customer's life that they treat every single conversation as if it was the last time they'll ever see the prospect in their lives. They have nothing to lose. They leave everything on the field. With a lot of sales teams I talk to, I always ask them, hey, would you rather have all your prospects come in ready, willing, and able to buy from you or would you rather them to be undecided and just looking around at their options? 100% of the time, every single person says, of course, I want every prospect to be ready to buy. But then I have to remind them that a sales warrior wants those just looking buyers. That's the beauty of commission-based sales. If you're selling something where every single person you talk to is ready, willing, and able, you're just an order taker. That's a salaried position. 
You see, a sales warrior goes into sales to gamble on themselves and make worth it money, not nine to five money. See, sales, I believe, is the worst paying nine to five job on the planet. You know why? Because it's not nine to five. A sales warrior's earning potential is limitless, but only if you truly want just looking buyers. The purpose of selling is also to buy from you today over all alternatives. See, people buy anything for one reason and for one reason only, because they believe that what they're buying will somehow improve their life. In the B2B world, life improvement looks like shorter production schedules. It looks like higher profit margins. It looks like more certainty in providing life improvement for their own clients. In the B2C world, life improvement looks like personal life fulfillment. Why would you want to wait even a single day to sell someone if you knew that information? Why would a CEO want to wait to have better profit margins? Why would a consumer wait to feel more personally fulfilled in life? Yeah, they wouldn't. See, a sales warrior's job is to help them narrow down their options, know your competition better than they know themselves, and be their advisor so they can choose you over everyone else. So why did I mention today over all alternatives? Because it's about building up urgency with your buyer so you can move them from just looking to sold. And urgency means today, not tomorrow or next week or next month, today. It's programming you to think in urgent terms. It's teaching you to think, how can I close this prospect today, right now? That's the true meaning of urgency. That doesn't mean every prospect will close that minute. The point is to get them to say yes. It's to get them to agree to the next step. The point is that you're removing any rules in your brain that tell you, I don't know, I think it's too soon for them to choose us. It's never too soon for your prospects to choose you. And focusing on urgency will make that mindset a reality for you. And learning how to sell to category one true just looking buyers is the sales warrior way. And running towards that mission will totally change your career. Now, Jason, on this purpose of selling, which is to convince the just looking buyer to buy from you today over all alternatives, The one place I've seen you get a lot of pushback is on the buying today. Like, Jason, isn't that too pushy? I don't want to be a pushy salesperson. And telling me that I've got to force people to buy today sounds really pushy. It feels uncomfortable. I don't want to do that. So what's your response to that? So my response to that is, again, you got to program your reticular activating system, which is a part of your brain. It's like your goal-seeking mechanism. So whatever you program in your brain to believe, you will will achieve it. And so if you – if you – the word today just says, look, if I believe that this product or service will improve my customer's life, if it will get them away from pain, then I have, I have, it's my perfect right to get them to do it today. Again, why would someone put off life improvement to next month or next quarter or next year or next budgetary season? They, they're not. Uh, they just, again, the reason why they put it off is because we or you have not convinced them that the value is there, that the reward outweighs the risk. And so that's what it's all about. It's figuring out how can we get them to do it. And maybe it starts with you. Maybe it starts with, do you believe that your product or service will improve their life enough that they should do it today? Perfect. Something else you talked about, Jason, was building up urgency with your buyer. And I happen to know that you wrote a book called Creating Urgency. So can you give us just a little snippet of urgency on creating urgency? What is urgency and how do you do that? So there's two types of urgency. There's emotional urgency and circumstantial urgency. So most people only focus on circumstantial urgency. We know it really well. So circumstantial urgency is, you know, buy now or you're going to miss out on blank. You're going to miss out on this product. You're going to miss out on this price. You're going to miss out on this deal. Um, the, but that's, that's not really true urgency. True urgency is emotional urgency, which is the desire to improve one's life. So people always pay extra for valet parking when they're late for a show, or they pay extra for Starbucks because, you know, they had this emotional desire to improve their life. So, so emotional urgency is about, again, what's the why? You know, why will this improve their life? How will it help them get away from pain and how will it help them move towards life improvement? And so the best advice I could give everyone right now is whenever you're first engaging with the customer, focus on emotional urgency, focus on understanding the why. Then 
you can close them later on circumstantial urgency. If you try to sell them in the beginning using circumstantial urgency, then it's, it's a fake sale. They, they, they're buying because of the deal. They're not buying because of life improvement. And we've all experienced that before, that those people end up canceling. They have buyer's remorse. Uh, they don't stick with us. And so, again, you want to build up the sale using true urgency, which is emotional, not circumstantial. Perfect. So the two things here is create emotional urgency, which is really selling the value of how what you're selling is going to improve their life. And once once you do that, then you can convince them to buy today because you have all of the backing for it. Number four, the objective of selling is to make people feel wanted and to achieve resolution. Here's one thing to always remember about selling. If you make people feel big, they'll buy big. See, make them feel small and they'll buy small. It's that simple. A sales warrior knows that the cure to ambiguity is certainty with the goal of absolute total resolution. Build up the customer's belief in themselves and in what you sell, make them feel wanted, and you'll have the resolution that leads to sales. Uh, Think about it this way. By asking your customers to buy, you're making them feel wanted. You're subconsciously telling them, This was created specifically with you in mind. I choose you to be our next customer. Will you accept? That's how you make people feel wanted to achieve resolution. You're giving them the cure to get them out of the mental prison of ambiguity, indecision, and uncertainty. By asking for the close, you're giving a gift. See, Mary Kay Ash is the founder of Mary Kay Cosmetics, one of the strongest sales organizations of all time. In her autobiography, she wrote that she told her sales team to pretend that every single person they talked to had a sign around their neck that said, make me feel important. She knew that when someone feels big and important, they'll buy big. And one of the greatest gifts you can give your prospects is to build them up and remove all that ambiguity that stops them from making a decision. When people feel ambiguity, the fight, flee, or freeze response, which is controlled by a part of the brain called the amygdala, lights up. That leads to stress and anxiety, both of which kill sales. So how do I avoid that? Lead, give them certainty, and ask for the close. When you really believe that every person you talk to wants to feel important, you'll ask everyone to buy. That executive you're selling to wants to feel like she's making a great decision to improve her business. That consumer you're selling wants to feel like he's providing for himself and his family to improve their lives. Your sales will skyrocket and your customers' lives will improve. It's really that simple. At its core, Sales is about resolution. It's about turning uncertainty into certainty. That's why I have such a problem when I hear people say, look, selling's about relationships. That's not the objective. There's nothing wrong with developing a relationship with your prospects, but when that becomes the goal, the sale always goes sideways. If your goal is to create a relationship, then you're not helping them. You're violating the philosophy of a sales warrior. Remember, all human beings move away from pain and toward life improvement. And a sales warrior's mission is to liberate them from any indecision. And the only way you can liberate them from indecision is by making your goal total and complete resolution. Jason, in this segment, you talked about making people feel important. And again, like other things we were talking about with rapport or connecting with people, I think there's a very positive way to do it, but there's also kind of a cheap way that that's not as sincere that doesn't work. So what are some techniques that you have on making people feel wanted? Well, to, to be to be genuine on making people wanted, it's really around those six human needs, which I know we talk about um, in a later session. But just just to kind of bring them back up is, you know, I'm all about becoming the missing need. So you know, how will your product or service give them more certainty? How will it give them more fun? How will it uh, make them feel more important, which is significance? How will it help them have more of a connection to maybe on a consumer side, their, their family, or on a business side, their company's uh, mission or vision or culture? How will it help them have more growth in life and more contribution, which is giving back to, to you know, to society or to, to, the, to the future? And, and so, 
you know, to me, making people feel wanted is figuring out what are their driving needs? What are their drivers? What's most really important to them? And then focusing on those. That's how you sincerely make them feel wanted. This is my favorite segment because it is so in alignment with the FPG vision of letting everyone know that they are enough. And to me, that, that's, that's my driver on asking for the close. And, and I love that you talk about that in this segment because to me, man, there's so many places in this world where we are hearing that we're not enough, that, we are, that we're feeling like we're not enough, where we're getting that messaging from the world um, and, and maybe even from ourselves. And so for me as a sales professional, I can't let myself be one more place where somebody feels like they're not enough. If, if I can handle somebody saying no to me after I ask them to buy, but I can't handle not asking them to buy and them having that wonder of, did I not think that their company was ready? Did I not think their salespeople could handle this? Did I not think that their culture could support it? I can't handle that. I, I can't have that. If they want to tell me no, I'm a big girl. I can handle that, but I can't be another voice that they are not enough. Yeah, Mary, I'm so glad that that you, you talked about this idea that our vision is to convince everyone they're enough. And the reason why people don't believe they're enough is because, again, they don't believe in themselves, they don't believe in their potential and their future possibilities. But the greatest thing about being a sales warrior is through your words and actions, you have the ability to convince people they are enough. And so make people feel wanted and, and make them feel that they're enough. Number five, selling is about getting the customer to buy sooner and for more money than they planned on. As the leader in the sales process, you can release your prospects from their ambiguity and indecision by adding urgency to the process. That means selling them more life improvement than they knew they needed faster than they anticipated. This belief is really all about the reverence for the art of sales. When I said people buy for one reason, and that reason is to improve their lives, as a salesperson, your job is to get them to that life improvement as fast as humanly possible. Again, people don't put off life improvement, but they have to be able to see how you can improve their life. If the only prospects you sell are the ready, willing, and able buyers, and they spend exactly the amount of money they thought they needed to spend, then they didn't need you. Your job is to show them the value they'll be missing out on by not paying more and getting more. The sales warrior believes it's their mission to paint a vivid, detailed picture of how their prospects' lives will improve when they choose you. You want them to buy sooner than they planned on because you're adding value they didn't already have. Maybe you're shortening a business production cycle so they can become more profitable and exceed the board's expectations. That's life improvement. Maybe you're selling to a family that will become more connected by buying from you. That's also life improvement. I want you to think about the buy sooner part of the equation for a minute. Uh, imagine you're about to leave your home to drive to a party and you have a route all mapped out. But on the way there, your GPS shows there's a wreck and it diverts you around the accident so you can get to your destination faster. See, as a sales warrior, that's what you're doing. You're that GPS system alerting your prospects that there's a better, faster way to improve their life than they realized. All they have to do is pay a little more and choose you to get it so they can avoid the wreck. But what are they avoiding by choosing you? They're moving away from pain and toward life improvement. That's the key. I want you to see this belief through the filter of your new sales warrior philosophy. Remember, all people move away from pain and toward life improvement. And the sales warrior's mission is to liberate them from any indecision. So if you're getting your prospects to buy sooner and pay more because it will fundamentally improve their life and their business, then of course, this is customer mission focused. As the leader in the sales process, you can help lead your prospects out of this terrible mental jail of ambiguity and indecision by adding urgency to the process. That means selling them more life improvement than they knew they needed and getting it to them faster than they thought possible. And every customer you will ever meet desperately wants that. Jason, in number five, selling is about getting the customer to buy sooner and for more money than they planned. 
is that disrespectful? Is that unethical to have to convince people to spend more money than they were planning on? No, it is not unethical or immoral to do that. Look, customers, they they have a certain paradigm or perception of what they believe um, something's going to cost, and most customers they 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 don't realize what the actual price of something is. And so your job first and foremost is to figure out what problem are they trying to solve? What life improvement are they trying to gain? And then and then your second task is to present your solutions to them and show them that if they really want to solve this problem, then they're going to have to pay more to get more, to get exactly what they want. And at the same time, that it's about buying today. It's about buying sooner. It's about not putting off that life improvement, whatever that life improvement is. That's your role. Mary, so often I hear from salespeople all the time that, Jason, you know, I could totally sell more if my customer would just match the price and terms of the competition. And my response every single time is, that is not selling. That's marketing. That's what, that's, what, that's what websites do. That's what Amazon does. They put things up on price and they change the price until someone buys it or doesn't buy it. And then they, they change the terms, change the product, et cetera. But that's not what selling is. Selling is this science and art of using your words to show people the value of why you're charging more than someone else and how it will benefit them by buying sooner versus waiting. Number six, the sales warrior is the primary source of confidence, motivation, hope, and certainty in the prospect's decision to buy or not buy. Outside voices are influencing your prospects all the time, every single day. They have a ton of different people and opinions telling them how to spend their money and what to spend it on. Maybe it's their friends telling them to choose someone else's brand instead of yours because that's what they have. Maybe it's their boss or their board telling them that now really isn't a good time to buy anything because you're not in their business's budget. It's a constant onslaught that they're not prepared to handle. Without a sales warrior, they get overwhelmed because they're not prepared to handle all these external objections. But you know one very important thing about all these outside voices? You are an expert in what you sell. They are not. The sales warrior is the chosen one who can provide freedom and liberation from all those outside voices. You know how you can provide confidence in your leadership. You know how to provide motivation to move forward in the sale. You know how to provide hope in what you're actually selling them. And you know how to provide certainty that they've made the right choice by going with you. Look, here's the thing. That company's board doesn't know your product or service as well as you do. They don't fully understand how much you'll improve their business. That consumer doesn't have all the knowledge you do about uh, what they're missing out on by not going with you. You do. The sales warrior recognizes that fact and they leverage it during the sale. Uh, They're not daunted by a gatekeeper or a skeptical consumer. They sell right through it. This belief is really all about belief in yourself that you are the primary source of all those things for your prospect. Uh, They're hearing advice from all sides, but so often it's an uninformed advice. It's not advice straight from the source. That's what a sales warrior provides. The sales warrior knows it's their goal to be the expert. They have so much knowledge about what they sell that they can instill that confidence, motivation, hope, and certainty to move forward with you. So don't allow someone who doesn't have the same knowledge give your prospects advice about how to move forward. Revere sales. Revere your mission. Revere your ability to improve your customers' lives by leading them forward with you. Jason, you say that the sales warrior is the primary source of confidence, motivation, hope, and certainty in the prospect's decision to buy or not to buy. But if a salesperson is not warrioring up and they're not that primary source of confidence, motivation, hope, and certainty, then who is? Where, where are our prospects getting that from? Well, they're getting that from their friends and their family. They're getting that from the media, uh, from, from all other sources, but that sales warrior. And, and so, you know, to me, you got to think about that. I believe that the conversation you're not present to is your biggest competitor. The conversation you're not present to is your biggest competitor. So the second that you... 
uh, um, stop talking to your prospect and they immediately go somewhere else. Where are they going to go? They're going to they're going to talk to their friends and family. They're going to look online. They're going to look at all these different. They're going to look at reviews. They're looking everywhere else, but talking to you. And so you have to realize that they're being sold by someone. The question is, are they being sold by you? Or are they being sold by their friends, their family, the media? But here's the thing, Mary, and I think we all know this. Everyone who's listening knows this, and that is, you're the expert. You're, you're the, you're their friends and family and media or their, or their bosses or coworkers, they don't know what you know. They're the expert in their field, but you're the expert in your field. And so stop letting your paycheck be in the hands of chance and choose to be the primary source of confidence, motivation, hope, and certainty in your customer's decision to buy or not to buy. Yeah, I think that's perfect. And, and, if, if everyone listening has had similar prospects that I have had in the the different products that I've sold, um, really I feel like the news and their friends and their family are their lack of motivation, their lack of hope, their uncertainty. So they're the the sales stopping department. So you're right, being being on top of that, being the most consistent, most educated. Uh, most evidence proven voice is the is the right decision for our prospects. This is huge because let's look at it on the business to business side. You know, you've got multiple stakeholders, and so again, let's say that you are uh, selling to the the head of operations, and your solution will absolutely make their department more efficient and effective. But there's multiple stakeholders involved, and so what do they tell you? They say, you know what, I can't do this until I run up the chain of command, until I talk to my boss and my boss's boss, and so forth. Well, right there, you have a choice, and that is, do you, do you put your life in the hands of chance? You say, okay, no problem, or do you realize that you're the primary source of confidence, motivation, hope, and certainty? And so what do you do? You immediately start coaching that buyer on what they need to sell to their boss and their boss's boss. And then better yet, you, you coach them and you sell them on the reasons why they should put you on the phone with their boss so that you can sell on their behalf. But again, you have to remember that you are the primary source. You, no one else. They are not equipped to sell you like you are. Number seven, resolution with every prospect arrives by balancing speed and flexibility. Almost every salesperson I've ever met has had at least one situation where they knew the best product or service for their prospect before their prospect did. If you think about it, a great salesperson is like a really effective doctor. If the prospect is visibly sick, which just means they're they're locked in a state of ambiguity or stress, it's the salesperson's job to diagnose that sickness and convince them to take the medicine they're prescribing to get better. If the patient isn't sick yet, it's the sales warrior's job to help the patient fully realize that if they don't change their habits and choose you, that sickness is right around the corner. Once you diagnose the problem of why they aren't satisfied with what they currently have, sales turns into a game of minutes. The biggest resource your prospects have isn't their money, it's their time. But guess what? So is yours. Your time is valuable too. The shorter you can shrink your conversion time, the more time you have to close more prospects and lead them to life improvement. So you need to be able to speak as efficiently and effectively as humanly possible. And that's where speed and flexibility comes in. Uh, Flexibility is where uh, you make sure you're listening to the wants, needs, and concerns of every prospect. It's where you understand pain points you didn't know before your conversation and flex to resolve them. Look, I believe in living a process-driven life. The fastest way to become a top 1% sales warrior is to have a sales process and follow it, which is the basis for our award-winning warrior selling program. But the sales warrior knows that sometimes you need to make tweaks and small course corrections within that process. That's flexibility. The goal is to understand two things. Number one, I want to close the prospect as fast as as I possibly can by using a process. And number two, I realize that being flexible within my process is the secret to maintaining rapport and keeping my position of strength. It's about balancing those two factors in every cell to give your prospects the gift of speed and flexibility. Combining these two means you can achieve resolution and provide life improvement they can't get any other way. 
The right amount of speed means you're following your process and not getting off track. The right amount of flexibility means you're handling objections and going with the flow at every point in the sale. The sales warrior knows how to do both. Jason, you say resolution with every prospect arrives by balancing speed and flexibility. And so I'm curious, is it purposeful that speed is the first word and flexibility is the second? Does the speed have to come before the flexibility or can we be flexible before the speed? That's a great question. I do think that those words are intentional. I do think that every salesperson needs to live by their process. All research says that the most successful salespeople and the most successful companies are uh, process-oriented salespeople and process-oriented companies. I mean, just look at like Chick-fil-A, for example. I mean, you can line up uh, at a Chick-fil-A and there's uh, uh, there's two rows of cars that are you know 20 rows deep, and you're through there in five minutes. How is that possible? Because they live by speed and by process. But at the same time, of course, you have to be flexible. But here's the thing, Mary, and I, I want us to have a conversation around this, and that is I think it's important for people to realize, you know, which side do they, they tend to be more on? Because if you are more on the speed side, like me, that's more of my tendency, then yes, you can come across as a little aggressive and maybe a little overbearing, maybe just sometimes. <laughs> on the, maybe. maybe. Maybe just sometimes. <laughs> on the other side, if you are um, more on the flexibility side, like that's more of your, like, your natural tendencies, more on the flexibility side, then you're going to come across as way too yielding-like and way too helper-like. You're there to like help them, and but you yield all the leadership over to them. And so I think it's important for a person to first identify like what side is their dominant is it more speed or flexibility? And then they need to work on their um, their secondary and they need to f- focus on improving in that area. Yeah, you're right. Because I definitely err on the side naturally of flexibility. So anytime somebody says something to me or could we customize this way? Could we customize this way? I'm like, oh, that sounds like so much fun. Yes, let's do that. Let's do, this. Let's do that. However, you're right. If I fall into that, the speed uh, profitability, all of that goes down. And now also the processes can't be followed as clearly. And and now it's not actually a service to a client to do that. So having that balance is really important. So that's the biggest thing on everyone to get out of this. If you agree with the belief system that resolution with every prospect arrives by balancing speed and flexibility, then again, first ask yourself, uh, what is your, your dominant tendency? What's your natural tendency to be more on the speed side or on the flexibility side? And then the second thing is you want to immediately start working on the other side so that you can achieve resolution with your buyers. Number eight, all customers have hidden and admitted needs, and it's the sales warrior's job to solve both. Every single person on earth has six primary human needs. They need certainty, which is the feeling of safety and security. They need variety, which is all about excitement and change. They need significance, which is feeling important and wanted. They need love and connection, which is all about feeling unified and approved by others. They need growth, which is the feeling of progress and development. And they need contribution, which is feeling like you're giving and serving the lives of others. Tony Robbins developed this concept, which is an evolution of Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Uh, These needs apply to everything in life. But when you apply this concept specifically to your sales, it becomes the single most game-changing way to improve your customers' lives. Everyone psychologically needs all six, but not necessarily in the same order. Maybe you have someone in your life who volunteers their time every weekend and spends weekends serving at various local nonprofits. They have a high need for contribution. For me, I'm constantly finding new conferences and courses to take because my highest human need is growth. The same is true for your prospects. It doesn't matter uh, whether you're selling to a consumer or you're selling to the CEO of a Fortune 50 company. They have to have these needs fulfilled. A high-level decision maker needs certainty because they need to know they're making the right decision for their company. A consumer needs certainty because they want to feel like they're making the right decision for them. In the end, it's the same human need. Remember when I said the only reason people buy anything is to improve their life? The reason they need to buy from you and improve their life is because they don't have one or several of those human needs met. Those needs aren't being fed by what they currently have. 
And so they're trying to figure it out. The sales warrior realizes they are the only true choice because they know how to figure out what those missing needs are and embody them for their prospects. So for instance, let's say you're going through your selling process and a prospect tells you, like, I really just feel like I'm paying too much for what I'm currently getting. Boom. You know, in that moment, they lack certainty. They're feeling uncertain about the value of what they currently have. A sales warrior pounces on that. Uh, they can now become certainty for that prospect. They consciously build up certainty in their prospect by focusing on value. That's how you become the missing need. If you can connect at least three of your customers' human needs to what you sell, you'll create an addiction to your brand. They'll feel connected to it and will keep coming back as long as their needs are continually met. If you connect all six of their needs, now you've created a super addiction. That's how you create an A plus referral source and a client for life. So Jason, all customers have hidden and admitted needs and the sales warrior's job is to solve both. So here's the big glaring question that I have, which is how do you solve a hidden need? I mean, you, you talk about uh, the six human needs and I love that, but how do we know and find out what those hidden needs are so that we can solve them? So I, I think it's important to always ask what we call three wise deep questions. And so it's never really the first why, you know? So let's say a customer's looking at buying a new home and they say, the reason why I need a new home is because um, I want to put my kids in a better school. Okay. Well, what's the why behind that? Well, the why behind that is because they feel like their kids are not getting the proper education they need. And they want to, of course, give them that proper education for their future. Okay. Well, what's the why behind that? Well, because in their current school, uh, they've had lots of uh, kind of straight C's and the, 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 the kids they're hanging around with right now, they're getting in fights and they feel like that uh, the, the, the friends they have, it's just not going to lead to the, you know, to the, the, the best outcome for them in the future. Okay. Well, what's the why behind that? Well, the why behind that is they're worried about their, not just their, their college career, they're worried about their future jobs. They're, they're worried about them never leaving the house and, and staying with them forever. And so I show that with you because you got to go as many whys deep as you need to be able to solve the real problem. And, and I just think, you know, again, I think that when, when you start talking to a customer, there is a subconscious desire to improve their life in most cases, a subconscious desire. Sometimes the customer is ready to go. Sometimes they know exactly what they want, when they want it, why they want it. It's real clear and you're good to go. But in most cases, there's some subconscious reason and your job is to go as many wise deep as possible uh, so they can admit those hidden needs. What are the hidden reasons? So let's go to a business example. So let's say, uh, let's say we got a lumber company who is selling lumber to, um, to home builders. So you've got a purchasing manager of a home builder who's calling the lumber company and is just price shopping. They're just seeing what kind of deal they can get that's better than their current supplier. Well, that's the admitted need, but that's not the hidden need. What's the hidden need? After you go several wise deep, you end up finding out that the current supplier is not meeting their, their delivery schedule. Well, why does that matter? Well, because now the home builder is not hitting their uh, production schedule that they need for their customer. Well, why does that matter? Well, because now customers are uh, threatening to cancel or they're looking for some sort of concession because the homes aren't being built on time. Okay. Well, now we get it. Now, the why is huge now. And so it's extremely important as a sales professional to go as many whys deep as possible so that you can provide the ultimate value to your prospects. I love this, Jason, because it, it brings something full circle for me. Um, earlier, you know, you were saying, you know, relationship selling is not the goal. It's not what you believe in. And, and I, I agree with that, right? We're, we're, we're trying to improve people's lives. We're trying to improve businesses. But this going three wise deep, you really are building relationship with people. And so I like this because it shows and it gives a roadmap to building a strong relationship that is based on your definition of rapport on staying on the same page, on helping them meet their needs. But when you're going through all of those whys with somebody and really understanding emotionally how it's connecting to them, um, you're building a relationship. So this looks like to me the correct way to build a business relationship. Yes. Yeah, I, and I love that you just defined it as a business relationship. It's a business relationship that is delivered in a friendly way. It's a business relationship that 
that has a likable tone to it. But again, your goal is not to be their friend and your goal is not to be liked. Your goal is to achieve their goals of life improvement. Number nine, the most important thing in selling is position of strength, how fast you can get it and whether or not you can keep it. Position of strength is a constant tug of war with your prospects. You may not be familiar with the concept, but you know what it feels like when position of strength changes hands. If you have a really great selling presentation and your prospect tells you, wow, I had no idea this existed, you have position of strength. When a prospect tells you, look, I'm just not sure this is right for us, they've gained position of strength back. The sales warrior knows that position of strength is either gained or lost within the first five minutes of every interaction, and they work to keep it throughout the sale all the way to the close. Your position of strength is nothing more than the reason your prospect is talking to you. See, what you sell is unique, and you already know how it will improve their life. Uh, That's what you need to tell them so you can start moving the sale forward. Your position of strength represents uh, what they like about what you're selling, what they heard about it, how they got interested, and why they got interested. Those are the vital pieces of information you can use to lead the sale. Look, here's why position of strength is so important. Number one, you get to determine the price and the terms of the sale rather than the prospect. Number two, The prospect has certainty in you as their advisor, which means they'll trust you to sell them. Number three, the prospect is all in emotionally rather than logically because they feel connected to you. It's important to get position of strength, but it's even more important to get it in the opening minutes of speaking to your prospect. If you do a quick Google search for open-ended questions, you'll get thousands of articles on why they're beneficial. But what those articles don't tell you is that open-ended questions don't give you position of strength. Uh, You need them to admit out loud what they like about you and then use that as an opening to improve their life. Position of strength puts you in the driver's seat of the sale. And a sales warrior knows that the only way to gain and keep position of strength is to be the leader all along the way. Jason, some of this, it could come across a bit aggressive. I mean, the sales training program is called Warrior Selling. Throughout this whole thing, you're talking about sales warriors. So now you're saying the most important thing in selling is position of strength, which which can also sound a bit aggressive. So can you clear some of this up for us? Yes. I, I mean, another way to look at position of strength is your position of value. It's, again, position of strength is what are the reasons why they're choosing you? You know, what specifically uh, do they see value in you? And the reason why position of strength is so important is because if you don't have position of strength based on the emotional and rational reasons why they should go with you and why your product and service is better than the price you're charging and better than the competition and better than what they're currently doing right now, then you're going to have to lower your price. And so, of course, look, selling is really, really easy as long as you just keep lowering your price. But the reason why you want position of strength is so that you can hold true to your value. So the more you get them to talk about what they specifically like about you, uh, why what you're offering is better than what they're currently doing now, is better than what else they're looking at, well, that's the position of strength that you have. And, And then you can justify the price that you're charging. You can justify the terms that you have. And if you don't have position of strength, that means they have position of strength, which means they're only going to buy when they want to buy and at their price. Number 10, performance equals knowledge minus leashes. Everybody wants peak performance. It doesn't matter if you're a race car driver or the CEO of a billion dollar company. Maximum performance is always the end goal. And we know that performance is just the result of your behavior. So we have to go deeper to really understand what creates the kind of performance that creates top 1% sales organizations. Performance comes from increasing your knowledge about something and decreasing the mental leashes keeping you from acting on that knowledge. Uh, One of the biggest blind spots within education as a whole is that we're told to believe someone's performance should be equal to their knowledge base. 
In sales, we're told to believe that when you hire a veteran, that translates into performance because of this huge knowledge base they have about sales. But you already know that's not true. Uh, we've, we've all seen veterans who've been in the industry for decades, and yet they don't close sales. And we've all seen brand new salespeople who end up in the president's club three months after starting the job. The reason isn't just because of their knowledge base. Increasing knowledge is important, but it's also about decreasing leashes. A leash is anything that stops you from acting on that knowledge you have. If you have a sales process, but you don't follow it when you're selling to someone with a higher net worth than yours or whose company is a lot bigger than yours, that's a leash. If you know you should ask for the sale with every prospect, but you never do when you're prospecting over the phone, that's a leash. If you know you have unlimited income potential, but you only believe you're worth $150,000 a year, that's a leash too. A leash is just anything that's not making you freer. That's not creating an environment where you feel stronger and bolder and more capable of following your process and closing the sale. What a sales warrior is constantly trying to do is build up their knowledge base, but also being hyper aware of the leashes they have so they can eliminate them. No one is immune to leashes. The best salesperson in the world has leashes. They come from experiences with bosses, mentors, trainers, peers, family, friends, customers. But becoming aware of the knowledge you're inputting into your mental hard drive and then working your leashes is the true way of the sales warrior. All right, Jason, performance equals knowledge minus leashes. And this is what the entire warrior selling training program is around this concept about how our results, the success, the amount of money that we're making is equal to the amount of knowledge we have minus the leashes, the things that hold us back from acting on that knowledge. And so um, one of the things I hear you talk about a lot is the idea that you know, you can be a veteran with a ton of knowledge, know everything about your industry, about your market, about your company, but have so many leashes, have so many fears that are holding you back that you're not, you're not as successful as you should be. And on the other side, we've got these people that are brand new, have no business making a lot of sales because they don't know what they don't know, but because they have no leashes, they are selling a ton. So is it better to be a veteran in your industry or is it better to be brand new? Well, it's a great question. It's better to be a veteran with no leashes. That would be the ideal unicorn salesperson I'm looking for. So I am not the sales trainer out there that says, we got to fire all the veterans. We got to only hire brand new people. I don't, I don't believe that. The ideal solution would be to have the experience of a veteran, but be leash free like a rookie. That's the ideal person. You know, Mary, I think it's important uh, for us to talk about though, you know, again, the, these leashes that people have, like, let me give you an example. You know, one of the, one of the types of leashes are reluctances. And we have, we've got uh, plenty of assessments here at FPG that can, people can take to figure out what specifically are their reluctances and reluctances are nothing more than fear. So, you know, one reluctance is they fear, have a fear of coming across too pushy. Another reluctance is they have a fear of talking about the money. Another reluctance is they have a fear of selling up to the C-suite or they have a reluctance of asking for a referral or selling to their friends and family or, a, a, or stage fright, group presentations, or they have a reluctance when it comes to the cross-sell or the upsell. Uh, these are all reluctances. There's so many reluctances people really have. And, but here's the thing I want everyone to know, and that is this. You were not born with a reluctance. You learned it. You learned it through uh, you know, a book that you read or a previous manager or a friend that said something like, make a friend, make a sale. Or maybe you were taught one time that if they're smiling, they're buying. Or you, know, you were taught that, you know what, when you sell to the C-suite, they're very different up there. And so you got to sell differently to them. You know, or respect your elders, or I mean, there's I can go on and on about all these different things we were taught. I was talking to one of our sales warriors uh, this past week, and recently he told me of a, a leash that he learned from a previous um, boss and previous training company where he said, in order to present a proposal, you have to know three people at three levels of the organization. And so I asked him, I said, well, is that true? Is it, have you ever sold anything by only knowing one person at one level? And he said, well, of course. He said, well, that's a leash that someone made up that silly rule 
that got in the way that's keeping you from earning what you're truly worth. And so my advice to everyone going forward is, is start noticing these leashes that you have, these, these rules or reluctances or stories that you, you have that are preventing you from moving a sale forward. These generalizations, these, these fake truths that you've locked onto and, and, and then do something about it. Find a way to let them go. You can talk to us about it. The best advice I would give you though is to ask yourself a simple question that is, is this true? Is it true that I, I 100% have to sell differently to my friends and family or I 100% have to sell differently to the C-suite or if I do ask them to buy today, I'm gonna come across too pushy. Is that 100% true? And of course, the answer is no, it's not 100% true. I can can remember being told at one of my sales meetings that the phone is a tool in order to get a face-to-face meeting with people because people do not do $100,000, million-dollar deals over the phone. You have to do that in person. And I can't even imagine how many sales I lost because I wouldn't go and ask for the clothes. I wouldn't have a real conversation over the phone because it was just a scheduling tool for me. And now it's funny because almost all the business we do is over the phone. Yeah, you're hundred percent right. I mean, it's, it's, uh, you know, I, I've heard that same one as well. And, you know, people, people would say that to me and, you know, I had an aha moment one day and that was, you know, we've been around now for over 10 years and there's only been a handful of conversations we've actually had in person, like sales conversations we've had in person where we've got contracts. Majority of our sales have all been over the phone. We close deals over the phone. And, and so, you know, again, for every person out there that has a leash, I promise you there will be someone out there that, that doesn't have that leash, and that person is always outselling the one that does. That's perfect. So find and get the advice from the person who is overcoming it, not from all the people that are, that are in alignment with it and making it more true and more leashed for you. Number 11, objections are between the customer and themselves, not between the customer and you. I want you to imagine a teenager and a parent talking over college options one day. The teenager is struggling with their college choice, and they're just frustrated because they can't figure out the right choice. There's a tense back and forth between the parent and the teenager because there's a lot of built-up confusion and ambiguity and frustration involved. And so, if you were to see that scene from a third-person perspective, it looks like the parent and the child are fighting, doesn't it? But what the parent has to realize is that the child isn't upset or frustrated with them. It's not about them at all. The lash out behavior is really just an internal conversation that teenager is having with themselves out loud. They're working through the problem and they can't figure it out. And now it's bubbling over. If the parent just responds with the same frustration and anger and confusion, they'll get nowhere. But if they understand what's really happening, They can patiently guide the child back the way they need to go. In other words, they can handle the situation because nothing is personal. It's not an attack. It's not even about the parent at all. The same thing is true when you're dealing with prospects. The objections they give you are just an internal conversation they're having out loud during the buying process. So when they tell you, this just seems really outside of our budget. What they're really asking themselves is, is the price worth the value? When they tell you, I'm just not sure, uh, we're going we're gonna to look at some other options. They're really saying to themselves, I just don't have enough certainty to move forward yet. The sales warrior sees it as their duty uh, to make those objections about resolution, not about the struggle itself. They commit to understanding the real objection is rarely what the customer says it is. Look, I see so many salespeople fall into this defensive trap uh, when they get an objection. It suddenly triggers this need to fire back with all the reasons they're wrong about that objection. Even if it's done in a friendly way, what's the problem with that response? It's not customer mission focused. You're engaging as if the customer has a problem with you. But that's not the case, is it? The sales warrior has this belief that there's no such thing as a personal objection. It's just a conversation the customer is having out loud that they can guide toward resolution. This is a powerful and liberating belief for a sales warrior. Think about what this means. If it's not about you, 
then everything is working in your favor. Nothing is a fight or an attack or a struggle. It's just a conversation you can help guide to total resolution without a shred of fear. Okay, so number 11, objections are between the customer and themselves, not between the customer and you. This is something that is so interesting because the first time I heard you say it, it was so obvious. I thought, oh my God, duh. How come I haven't thought about it that way my whole life? My whole life it has been, I am battling, I am overcoming this objection. I'm you know, putting on my sales armor to go overcome this. But of course it's not about me. Of course it's not, of course it's just between the the customer and themselves. And so what I love about this is the reverence that it gives the sales warrior for their own emotional control. I mean that that is one of the things that makes a great sales warrior is being able to dissociate, which is to step outside of ourselves and to see the situation from a third party view and go, "Okay, this is not about me." I can, I can look at this from an outsider's view and I can now handle it and I can help the prospect work through their own internal conflict to come to resolution. I love this, Jason. Yeah, that's it. And again, I'm, I'm not saying by any stretch of the imagination that I have mastered this. There are plenty of, of sales that I have paused in my career, uh, even recently, because someone gives me an objection to you know, to our training or to one of our services that we're providing. And, you know, I take it very personally. And, and it's about, again, stepping, stepping back and realizing that they're just verbalizing and talking things through. Again, they're just sharing their thoughts out loud. They have this inner monologue that now is coming out. And if we can just kind of step back and facilitate that conversation between, you know, part of their brain that says, I want to do this, this makes a lot of sense. And the other part of their brain that says, whoa, this seems like it's going to be very expensive or this seems like it's going to be a lot of work. And if we can kind of facilitate and create kind of a parts alignment between the two parts, then we're going to get the sale. But as soon as we associate to it, we jump in and we take that personally, then again, we're out of rapport with the buyer and we definitely can't give them certainty and education to move them forward. Number 12, a sales warrior can sell anything by breaking it down into small decisions. In the climbing world, there's something called a pitch. A pitch is the length of a climb that can be protected by one rope. So a typical rock climb would have a bunch of different pitches. The climber would climb up uh, the length of a rope, drive a wedge into the rock to support their weight, and then climb up the next pitch until he gets to the end of the rope. And then the next pitch and the next, and on it goes until they reach the top. Uh, This serves two purposes. It's to make sure the climber is always protected by a rope connected to the rock, but it's also to break up the climb. Think about it. You're standing at the bottom of this huge rock face staring upwards and you can't even see the top. That's an overwhelming thought. So rock climbers have this mantra, just focus on the next pitch, just focus on the next pitch. This is a powerful idea that all sales warriors take to heart. It's about one step, one decision, one customer at a time. It's about accomplishing the next step in the sale, then the next, then the next you can't focus on the top of the mountain. That just creates this anxiety-filled state of mind. I've seen salespeople look at their quota for the month and it just freezes them up. Instead, I tell them to focus on the next step in the sale. It's about focusing on everyday wins. So what's one way you can win every day? Maybe that means making that follow-up call you've been putting off. Or maybe it's about actively handling that objection instead of letting it pass you by. Or maybe it's about conquering your fear of talking to high-level purchasers and picking up the phone. When you feel overwhelmed, the brain essentially shuts down. It stops regulating a chemical called cortisol, which controls things like your energy level, how well you sleep, and your blood pressure. So you feel drained. Your immune system doesn't work properly and you're more likely to get headaches and crushing anxiety. And when you feel overwhelmed by decisions, you transfer that emotion to your prospects. So how do you avoid all that? You break it down into smaller decisions. You focus on the next pitch. And when that becomes your mantra, 
You're embodying the beliefs of a sales warrior. So 12 is a sales warrior can sell anything by breaking it down into small decisions. And so I love this in concept, but Jason, can you share what some of those small decisions would be? Yes. I mean, this, this one is so important. I mean, again, I just, let's just hear it out loud again. A sales warrior can sell anything by breaking it down into small decisions. You know, uh, you and I, we, we actually um, adapted this one going through the neuro-linguistic programming training that we did. Uh, one of our belief systems that we learned is that a person can master anything by breaking it down into small chunks. And so when I first heard that, I really liked that idea. And I believe that's the same thing when it comes to selling. And so, you know, there are these decisions people have to make. I mean, one decision is, is um, you know, do I need to make a change? Another decision is, do I feel safe in the economy right now? Another decision is, do I believe I can afford it? Are the financial benefits uh, there? Another decision is, uh, do I uh, believe in the product? Another decision is, do I believe in the brand of the company that I'm buying from? You know, another decision is, uh, do I believe it'll improve my life? Do I believe that if I buy now, uh, then then it's worth buying now, or I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to miss out if I don't buy now? Uh, these There's so many different decisions that people are kind of making along the way. And my belief system is that a customer is doing this with or without you. And so if you as a sales warrior can break down all of the decisions into bite-sized chunks, then you can focus on one decision and the next decision and the next decision. And that to me is how you can make those everyday wins. And so, for example, one of the things that we do when we coach salespeople is we say, you know what, let's, let's redefine what a sell really means. There's all kinds of sales. And of course, there's the big sale that we all want, which is uh, that we got the customer to say yes, and we got them to sign the DocuSign. We, we get that. That's what we want. But there's a lot of mini sales that we can get along the way. We can get them to say yes, that they're going to leave their current supplier. We got them to say yes, that they believe in your price. They got them to say yes, that we, they believe in your product and your brand and your company's value and all these different things. And so going forward, give yourself the gift of, of everyday wins and everyday sales by breaking um, um, every single major cell you have into small uh, mini cells or therefore mini decisions. I love this. And Jason, I've heard you say before that when you go back and analyze any sale that you haven't closed, you then are able to realize that you had missed one of those smaller decisions along the way. That's exactly right, Mary. And, and I will tell you, it's one of the best things that you can do is, is right now, uh, just make a list of all the different decisions that you feel like your customers need to make before they can make the main decision, which is to go with you. And then going forward, make it your goal that you are closing those decisions uh, one after another. And last, every time that you pause a sale and it's not moving forward with you, go back to that list of decisions and figure out which one have you not closed. Number 13, the why must be greater than the sacrifice the customer needs to make. The human brain is made up of two sides, the logical side and the emotional side. The left side of your brain controls all of your rational analytical thought. Uh, from a buying perspective, all of those logic-based objections you hear come from the left side. Their logic is literally getting in the way. The right side of the brain controls your emotions, and this is the important part, it also controls your decisions. So think about it. The decisions your customers are making are constantly being controlled by the emotional processor in their brain, not the logical one. Harvard Business Review did a study that found that 95% of all purchase decisions happen emotionally, not logically. They happen on a subconscious emotional level that isn't being controlled by that logical processor. It doesn't matter if they're purchasing for their business or purchasing for themselves. We are genetically wired to make decisions emotionally. When you tell a purchasing manager you can save her thousands of dollars per sale in operating cost, the why is everything. Maybe it means they can have more significance in the eyes of their peers or boss. Uh, maybe it means they'll have more certainty knowing that their job is safe and that the company is even more stable with the increased income. Again, these are the whys behind the selling message that move the sale forward. 
Every sales warrior knows that emotion trumps logic. And so they sell the why. The why behind your selling message is what closes the sale. It's not about the things like your company's history or your customer service record. Those things are nice, but they aren't what really connects with customers on a deeper level. The why is the life improvement you offer. It's the emotional benefits they'll receive when they buy from you. It's the reason they'll become more fulfilled than they were before they met you. I always say you need to go as many whys deep as it takes to close the sale. So what do I mean by that? A why is just the emotional fuel that helps your customers overcome the objections they have in their mind. So how will you improve their life? What will it do for them on an emotional level that they aren't getting right now? It means expanding on those emotional benefits until the customer thinks, why would I ever go with anyone else? But here's the thing. Every purchase involves some kind of sacrifice on the customer's part. A lot of times the customer is sacrificing the price they thought they were going to pay for something that cost more. The cure to that is emotional urgency. It's emotional connection. It's understanding that the why must be greater than the sacrifice the customer needs to make. So Jason, number 13 here says the why must be greater than the sacrifice the customer needs to make. And something really interesting that that you said in this part was about all of the decisions that we make are from the emotional side of our brain. They're all emotional. And what's really interesting is most of the B2B sales warriors and sales professionals that I've worked with will say, Mary, it's all about price. It's just RFPs. Nobody's paying attention to it. It's not emotional. It's just all about logic. It's all about the numbers and the bottom line. And that's why people buy. And I heard this. I've heard this when I was selling. I hear this now on the training side, working with other sales professionals. But what's interesting to me now as a purchaser for a company, as somebody that B2B salespeople are coming after quite often, it is much more emotional on the business side than it is on a personal side. So when I think about it, if I'm buying a product or a service or something for myself, the only person that's affected is me and maybe you know my close family members. But if I'm, if I'm making a purchase for the company, that's highly emotional because I realize it's not just me that's affected. It's every one of our employees. It's every one of our clients. It can be every one of our other vendors. It's a big deal. And so I really like how much we talked about decisions are made on the emotional side of our brain and that all decisions are emotional. Yeah, you're, you're exactly right on that. And, and, um, you know, let's talk about that business decision as well. So, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of always sell the person in front of you. I know another school of thought out there is that you want to ask and find out who are the decision makers involved. And then what you end up doing is you pause your cell and say, okay, well, um, why don't we get everyone um, on the call together and I'll present to all of you guys at the same time. Well, well, then what does the person say back to you? Well, they get kind of offended in most cases because they're, they're on a task or on a mission to figure out, is this the right decision for their department? And are they going to put their reputation on the line to promote uh, what you're trying to sell them uh, to their boss? I mean, it's their careers on the line. You know, one of the things that, that we believe at FPG is we're in the business of getting people promoted, that we're all about you know, showing a person how if they bring us into their company, then they can, they can get a career boost off of it because of all the, all the speed and profitability it's going to bring their organization. But so here's the thing, though, that you first have to show the reasons why your product and service will improve the company's life. And you have to get the person in front of you to to say yes to that, that they believe that's the case. And then once that why is greater than the sacrifice, what's the sacrifice? Sacrifices in that case is them having to put their neck on the line. Their, their reputation on the line to say, hey, boss, I know that we said that we're, we're tightening down the budget right now, but I've got a really good solution that I want to put in front of you. That's what you're up against. That's the sacrifice. In that case, it's extremely emotional because it's about their name. It's about their reputation. Number 14, a warrior cell is conflict, challenge perspective, compromise, and collaboration. I want you to think about the easiest sell you've ever made in your life. It's the person you talked to once and they bought from you right away. And it was so easy, you almost couldn't believe it. Now, 
think about them as a client. For my years of experience in sales, the easiest sales become the most difficult clients. Now I want you to think about a more challenging sale you made. Maybe they had a ton of objections along the way. They were constantly making you force the compromise so you could meet in the middle. You had to challenge their perspective on something so they could see it differently. There was constant conflict. In my experience, those prospects who I warriored up to close became my absolute best clients. They became my most loyal clients who stayed with me for years. The entire reason for that is because I worked for the sale. It's because it wasn't a market sale. It was a warrior sale. It was like we went through this battle together and we came out the other side on the same team. And now we had this incredibly strong rapport. You don't grow your business year over year over year with market sales. You do it with warrior sales. A market sale is like the first example I gave. It's those easy sales that don't require any real selling. And sales warriors are not seduced by the market sell. They embrace productive conflict that brings resolution because we know that true resolution can't possibly happen without productive conflict. They're constantly challenging the prospect's perspective about something they believed to be true that held them back from buying. They force the compromise and get the prospect to see that there are no unicorn products or services. And they collaborate with their prospect all along the way to keep that steady rapport throughout the sale. Being a sales warrior is all about being proactive versus reactive. It's about deciding to take action versus letting the world decide for you. It's about seizing the opportunity in front of you. I love this quote from former president Harry Truman. People make history, not the other way around. Uh, you make your own history, and that doesn't happen by passively waiting for market sales to fall in your lap. It happens when you take the path of a sales warrior and make every sale a warrior sale. Here we are, Jason, at number 14, a warrior sale has conflict, challenge perspective, compromise, and collaboration. And I love the example you gave of the very easy sale and now they cancel fast because I can think of the fastest sale I ever made was also the fastest cancellation I ever had. And But even, even having that experience, I never really put it together that it was important to have conflict and challenge perspective and compromise and collaboration. So I'm wondering here if somebody is trying to purchase really fast. Okay, so this is also, we talked about emotional control earlier. So I have somebody they want to buy right now. I've only had one conversation with them. I don't know a lot about them. We've had no conflict, no challenging perspective, no compromise, no collaboration. They love everything I have to say. They're ready to sign. Do I add in challenging perspective? Do I add in compromise? Do I, do I add conflict or do I, do I take the check? I know this is going to sound completely crazy in what I'm about to say, and that is you absolutely do. You absolutely find a way to, in, to, to bring in some sort of conflict by, by, in that case, challenging perspective. His conflict is, is they've got conflict with you. That's conflict is when they have an objection, when they say no to you, um, and then you handle that conflict and you work through it. Uh, challenging perspective is when you get them to see things differently. So, for example, um, this would be a great opportunity to upsell them and to cross-sell them. So a customer you know, just says, look, I just want to buy exactly what, what you're offering here. Well, it's to figure out what are they really trying to solve? What is the problem they're really trying to solve? What's the life improvement they're really trying to get? And then what you'd want to do is you want to, you'd want to challenge their perspective by showing them how if they paid a little bit more, they can get a little bit more value. Or if they added these additional services uh, and then paid a little bit more, then again, that value would be there and they could get to that life improvement they want or that business improvement they want even sooner. And, and again, you got to trust me when I say this. There's so much research that, that, that proves that that relationship will be more loyal and more profitable and more long lasting when there is that challenge perspective, when there's that conflict, uh, when you're taking them through that collaborative compromising uh, based relationship. Well, I love that because it also changes our perspective when it comes to the challenging prospect. Because I know now when somebody's asking me a lot of questions, when I give them a list of references and they get all glowing references and they want more references to call. And then they want to talk to me again. And then they've, they've gone to their mastermind group and come back with another list of questions. I know that's going to be a great client. 
And so now um, when I'm going through and having another call and another call, I get excited about that now because I know this is somebody that's going to be really loyal. This is somebody I'm going to have a long-term relationship with. This is somebody that um, we're going to really grow and have a lot of success with. And so I think it's on both sides. It's, it's how do we change when it's too easy, but also really revering and and have being appreciative when somebody is a difficult prospect. Oh, you're 100% right. I mean, when, they, when they're calling because they were tasked to find sales training for their organization and they immediately just say, I want to sign up for this and and we take their money, they, they're they not all in. Training is just something they're just checking off some sort of box. It's what their CEO told them to do, but they're not all in. That's not a cultural strategic initiative for their organization. But on the flip side, uh, when they are asking all those questions that you're talking about, and they are looking for references, and they are challenging constantly, and they're comparing to the competition that's out there, uh, that means that they're all in. That means it's a strategic initiative for the organization, which means they're going to be a all-in customer, which is our, our absolute most favorite type of customer we have. Number 15, the coaching along the way makes all the difference. Sales warriors uh, don't just want coaching or even ask for coaching. They demand coaching. No great athlete has ever said, you know what? I've got this all figured out. I don't need coaching. I'll take it from here. Of course not. Even future Hall of Famers know that to get to the next level, they need coaching. They're aware of that fact because coaching got them to that level in the first place. It doesn't matter how good you are. A great coach will always push you to the next level. So if you're serious about becoming a sales warrior and making worth it money, you don't wait for coaching. You go out and demand it. Your level of improvement is a direct result of your desire for coaching. It's pretty simple. How much you want coaching is directly tied to how much you want to improve. And to truly have the mindset of a sales warrior, it's not just about uh, being open to coaching. You have to absolutely demand it. It's the fundamental difference between these two statements. Asking sounds like, I would love some some coaching from you on this at some point in the future, if you don't mind. Demanding coaching sounds like, I have a problem right now, and I really need your perspective on it today so I can close the sale. I ask coaches this question all the time. What percentage of your employees are currently on a plateau? Every time I ask this question, people usually say 20%, 50%, 70%. The correct answer is actually 100%. Unless, what a great word, unless, unless they have a coach. It's 100% unless they're demanding coaching. And that coach is responding by unleashing them with the strategies to earn what they're truly worth. That's the benefit of a true coach-employee relationship. The most common pushback against coaching that I hear from salespeople is that they believe that by demanding coaching, they're somehow admitting that they're broken or that they have no clue what they're doing. That's not at all what demanding coaching is about. Demanding coaching is believing so strongly in your growth that you can't exist without learning and growing. It's really a message about self-empowerment, not self-doubt. Imagine if a professional athlete had a problem with their golf swing or couldn't figure out their playbook. Do you think they would say, I'll figure it out. If I do it enough times, uh, the answer will just magically come to me. Of course not. They'd go to their coach. They'd say, hey coach, I can't figure this problem out. And I know we've got a game today. So I really need you to help me fix this. Look, just the same, be the sales warrior who demands coaching so you can earn what you're truly worth. All right, the last one, number 15, the coaching along the way makes all the difference. So I'm interested, who in your life have you demanded coaching from? I mean, I can think of a lot of examples where I've demanded coaching. I mean, I demand coaching from you all the time when we're we're, uh, speaking together and right afterwards, I immediately ask for feedback on on how, how did that go? Or, or I'm doing a coaching session, a live coaching session on one of our master classes, and, and I'm asking you, you know, how, again, how did that go? And what could, what could we have done better with that? And so I feel like I'm constantly demanding coaching on the mentors I've had in my life um, or peer groups or mastermind groups. 
Look, I think it's important to always demand coaching because I believe in our life, we're gonna be measured by two things. And that is who did I become and how did I make a difference? How did I truly contribute to the world? How did I make an impact in the world that really matters? And I just don't think it's possible that a person can do that without coaching. They can't. And so the coaching allows them to become more and contribute more. That's perfect. We've talked a lot today about what makes a good coach of who are the people to go and listen to and the people that are being successful in areas that you want to be successful, the people that are unleashed, the people that are successful in the things that we want to be successful in, the people that are unleashed and they aren't listening to what um, the the general population is telling them to do. I mean, we know if we want to be the top 1%, 99% of the people are going to tell you what you're doing is wrong, is going to tell you it's not what they're doing. Well, of course, it's not what they're doing. They're not top 1%. So I love that you've given all of these ways to find the right people to follow, the right people to listen to, to know how to filter it. And now the last step bringing it all together is to go and demand coaching. So Mary, I love the direction that you're going with this. And you, you, know, you talked about that you, you want to find people that can coach you that are unleashed, that are fearless, that are in that top 1%. But what's some other advice that you can give people listening right now on what they should look for in a coach? What other characteristics uh, would you want uh, people to look for when they're, when they're searching or seeking out that coach? That's a good question. And I, th- I think it, sometimes it's the opposite of what we think. Um, for instance, I want to find somebody who's extremely busy. I want to find somebody who's involved in a lot of things. I want to find somebody that has great success because I know those are the people that are truly successful because I want to be able to be involved in a lot of different things at a high level, being very successful and and contributing a lot. So I want to find somebody who's just like that. I don't want to find somebody that's sitting around and doesn't have the time. Now, knowing that they're very busy, knowing that they have a lot of responsibilities, knowing that they have a ton on their shoulders, I want to be really respectful of that. I want to be clear on what information I need from them. So I think the most important thing also when demanding coaching is the same thing as in sales. You don't go in and ask about the weekend. You don't go in and ask about the Cowboys game. You go in with, here is exactly what my problem is. And I'm very clear on what the problem is but I'm not clear on the solution. Can you give me three steps? Very clear like that. When people come to me like that, I can give them the answers. I'm ready for them. I'm excited to talk to them. And the most important thing after that is is to follow back up with anybody that you've demanded coaching from to let them know the outcome of their their coaching. I mean, people will want to coach you more when they feel like they've contributed to your success. So once you follow the, the three, five steps, follow exactly what they say to do, and then you come back and say, hey, I just wanted to follow up and say, thank you. Here's how this worked for me. You know, here's how I was successful because of it. Well, now the next time you go and ask for coaching again, they're going to be very excited about it. They're going to, they, now they'll start making time for you. I mean, still be conscious of the time they're giving you. Still go in with clarity, but know that every time you do that, every time you give them a win as your coach, they're going to give you more. And that's how you really build out a beautiful mentor relationship. Awesome. That was well, well, well said. And that's, that really beautifully concludes um, this audio book. I mean, we, we, we have two truths at FPG that we live by, and that is our beliefs have more to do with our success than our abilities. And everyone learned our philosophy of being a warrior sales professional, as well as the 15 beliefs. And now it's about finding the tactics and the tools that you can use to reinforce and master uh, this philosophy and master these beliefs. And of course, this last one, which is our second truth, and that is the coaching along the way makes all the difference. And so, you know, be someone going forward that is, is mastering your own philosophy, be someone that is, is mastering your mindset, mastering your beliefs, and be someone who is always coachable, who's always uh, living your life saying, you know what, how can I become more and how can I contribute more? Now that you know the philosophy and beliefs of a sales warrior, what would happen if you had a team that believed, embodied, and lived out each one? How much would your profit improve? How much more fulfilled would your team be on a daily basis? How many more lives would change? Empower yourself. Empower your people. 
and empower your results by making the decision to become a sales warrior today. Get in touch with us to find out more about adopting the beliefs of a sales warrior so you can change your company forever. Visit us on the web at www.fpg.com, email us at sales at fpg.com, or call us day or night at 1-800-821-3956. Here's to becoming a better version of you.